So this morning's sermon is going to be about God's protection. God's protection. Of course, when you read through Psalms 37, it's real easy to see there that God is warning us over and over again to not envy the wicked, to not fret ourselves at the wicked. And he also talks about how you know, the wicked are going to prosper. They're going to spread themselves like a green bay tree, that they're going to prosper in their land, but their end is to be cut off. And in the meantime, we are to rest in God's protection. He's saying to wait on the Lord, to trust in Him, that the end of the righteous is going to be, uh, is going to be, it's going to be well with Him. Whereas with the wicked, they're going to be cut off. And really, there's a major theme here in this passage about God's protection. And I feel like God's protection is an important topic th uh, this morning because of the fact that when you have a proper understanding of God's protection, it gives you peace. And people have a mistaken notion, I think, today of what it means to have God's protection in their life. They think that just because they have God's protection that absolutely no harm is ever going to come to them, that they're never going to be put in uncomfortable situations, that they're never going to have to suffer anything. But that's just not the case, as we'll see here in Scripture. However, that is not to say that God does not protect His, his people, because He does. We know that's true. So when we have a, a, an, a, a proper understanding of God's protection, that gives us peace. And peace is important to have. It's something that we need to have today because of the fact that we are living in such uncertain times. I mean, this has been one of the craziest years, just from one year to the next. I mean, we've gone, I mean, we went into 2020 thinking it's just going to be another year like any other year. And it's probably been one of the most uncertain years of many of our lives. You know, and I can say that for myself. I've never uh, faced such uncertainty about what's going to come in the future. I mean, we just look at the things that are going on in our society. And we can, when we do that, again, we, have, we, we can begin to appreciate and understand the need to have peace. And that peace comes from having a proper understanding of God's protection. Because, again, we just see a lot of upheaval in life these days. We see a lot of uncertainty. We're living in very uncertain times For, you know, in, in society. I mean, we all know COVID-19. I mean, that thing has just been this whole situation, whatever your opinion, uh, opinion about it is, Nobody can deny the fact that it has, it has altered society, the way people are living their lives, going about their lives. And we don't really see the end in sight. We don't know when this thing's going to go away. We don't know when it's gonna come, if it's going to come back mutated or, or who's telling the truth and who's not. We just have to just kind of trust people to, 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 to give us the, the facts. You know, are we being manipulated? Are we not? You know, we know the virus is real. Are the numbers being inflated? We don't really know. It's a lot of uncertainty. You know, we're going to come back into the winter season. Is this thing going to be gone in 2021? Or is there going to be a mutation or so on and so forth? There's just a lot of uncertainty just in that one thing alone. You know, if that, if that one thing alone in, this, in 2020 has been enough to, to cause a lot of uncertainty. But then you add on top of that, you know, all the, uh, how about all the civil unrest that's taking place in our country today with the whole Black Lives Matters and, and, and things like that, all these protests. I mean, good night, they're sending, you know, federal agents to try and break up these crowds in cities like Portland. You know, and you know, previously we saw the riots and the burning and who knows what's going to take place, how much longer that's going to go on. The economic instability in our country today. All these stimulus checks are being go, uh, going out. Of course, that's linked very closely to COVID-19 and the whole shutdown there. But there's just all this uncertainty in our world today that we live through day by day, the COVID-19, the civil unrest, the economic how, uh, instability, how about the unceasing wars? I mean, that's something that's not new to 2020. Just these unceasing wars of aggression. We don't know when the next major world war is going to break out. I mean, it could, it could just start, you know, tomorrow. One, one bad move by some, you know, leaders in some nation somewhere, and somebody else is going to take advantage of that and probably, you know, or potentially you know, spark a whole nother world war. We don't know when these things are going to happen, but we knew, do know that it is going to happen at some point. The ideological divide in our country. I mean, we're, we're living in a country that has just such an ideological divide. We have one hand, you know, that's saying, hey, we want socialism. You know, we want this leftist Marxist philosophy to take over society. Then you have other people who are resisting that and so on and so forth. And, you know, not to mention just this looming powder keg of an election that is on the horizon. I mean, who knows what's going to happen if Trump gets elected again? I mean, there could be some good things that happen. You know, I'm not a pro-Trump guy. I'm not a pro, you know, I'm not a pro any politician. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're if that office that you're running for, I, I'm just, this is my opinion. And I'll throw it out there at the risk of sounding like a nut job. But, 
it's my opinion that you don't get to the highest office in the land without getting your hands dirty. Right. And you can take that however you want. So anyone who's in that office, in my opinion, is a corrupt individu individual. And anyone who knows anything about Donald Trump knows that guy is a scumbag anyway. <laughs> I mean, the guy is scuzzy. You know, he's running casinos and strip clubs. The guy is filthy, okay? He's got a filthy mouth, so on and so forth. But if that guy gets elected, who knows what our society is going to do? All these thugs out there that are burning everything down and just can't stand Trump. You know, if he gets another four years, who knows what's going to happen? Or, you know, what's the alternative? We get that other bozo in there. What's his name? Uh, no. uh, Kanye. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, I'm actually kind of rooting for Kanye this year. I don't know. Maybe he'll pull it off, you know. I mean, if we're going to have a bozo in there, at least, you know, it'll be entertaining. Get a few more documentaries out of it. But <laughs> the other guy, Biden, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Creepy Joe. <laughs> creepy Uncle Joe Biden. Right. You know, the guy who said all the weird things. And who knows, you know, he'll get in there and then we'll have this other. Who knows how that'll affect us? How that'll affect society? You know, maybe. Because at least with Trump, you can at least say, you know, they associate us kind of with him, even though we don't associate ourselves with them. And people kind of are more reluctant to go after conservatives and things like that, people who are more conservative leaning because you have a guy like Trump in the White House, you know, whatever that's worth. But the point being is this, is that we're living in uncertain times. We don't know what's going to happen in society. And even we're living in uncertain times, we, even within our own group, even within our own uh, circle of believers. This has been a year of upheaval, a lot of, uh, you know, Judas's false brethren, you know, the mounting persecution from the world, that's not going to stop. That's only going to increase, at, you know, as perilous times come, you know, men, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And, in, you know, I don't want to give you this, uh, in a sense of anxiety, but this is the reality that we're living in. And I have, I have a hard time believing that there aren't people, uh, you know, in our church that maybe aren't, f uh, aren't suffering from maybe a little anxiousness that aren't feeling a little uncertain about what lies ahead. And here's the thing. We should have peace, even in these uncertain times, because we have the promise of God's protection through whatever happens. And it's important to understand that uncertainty about the future is nothing new. There's been many generations that have gone on before us that have faced uncertain times. We're not the first ones. And if you would, keep something in Psalm 37. We're going to come back several times throughout the sermon. But uh, go over to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. You know, uncertainty about the future is nothing new. We're not the first people to go and live through uncertain times. You know, God's people, even just mankind in general, you know, have functioned and prospered in the face of uncertainty and even persecution. You know, I'll, I'll read, I'll just remind us very quickly the example of Israel and Egypt. I mean, imagine growing up or living back then, you know, when the generation that knew not Pharaoh arose, or do not Joseph, excuse me. And they started to say, hey, these, these Israelites, are, are, there's too many of them. You know, if, if, they, if we go to war, they're going to fall out onto our enemies. Let's start killing the babies and start commanding the Israelites to toss, you know, their, their goodly children, their, their sons in the, in the water. Go cast them in the river. That's what they were. That was the mandate that came down back then. That was what the government decreed back then was to, hey, you need to go kill any, any of your, your, your sons. That's a very uncertain time to live through. Imagine what they went through. <coughs> but they managed to do that, of course, and we know that they didn't give in to that command that, and, and so on and so forth. We know the story there. The point I'm trying to make is that we are not the first people to face uncertain times. In fact, I would say that the people back in Moses' day faced even more uncertain times. You know, more drastic measures. What about the example of the folks in the early church who lived through that persecution? If you're in Acts chapter 12, Look at verse 1. At about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James and, and the brother of John with the sword. Now, that's how you vex the church. Okay, that, that's, a, you know, when you have a government that's you know, overreaching the point where they're, vex, they're actually killing members of your church, you know, that's when you're really facing some uncertain times. And because of, he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then there were the days of unleavened bread, verse 4, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in the prison and delivered him into the four quinturions of soldiers to keep him, intending that after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God for him. Jump down to verse 18. You know the story. The angel comes, kicks Peter in the side, says, get up, and walks him out of the gate. 
uh, right out of the city, and he goes back to the church. In verse 18 it says, Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter, that he had escaped. And when Herod had sought for him, he found him not. He examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And when he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Verse 20, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord uh, to him, and having made blast his king Chamberlain, their, uh, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace that their country was nourished uh, by the king's country. And so on and so forth. And of course, you know how this ends here. It, it, verse 20, through it, it, well, well, let's just go to verse uh, 21. And upon a set day, Herod, uh, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And he, the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms. Now that's very, uh, how exactly that played out, I'm curious to know. Was that like an instant thing, or was that something that he kind of had to go through? And it says, and he gave up the ghost. But look at verse 24. This is what I want to focus on. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And what happened to the Israelites when they persecuted them and they added taskmasters unto them? The more they persecuted them, the Bible says, the more they multiplied. When we go through uncertain times, like, our, like others that have gone before us, you know, God protects us. Yeah, we might get uncomfortable. You know, somebody might get taken and killed. You know, they might have a government that's overreaching and even vexing certain members of the church. Someone might end up in prison. But even through that, God protects his people, not by keeping them out of harm's way, but by multiplying them, growing them, causing them to prosper. And these examples of the past, these should encourage us about the coming persecution. And there is persecution coming. We already see forms of it today. There is a mild persecution upon God's people here in this country. But, I mean, there's even parts of the world today where people are going through literal physical persecution, where people are killed for the cause of Christ. That happens. You just don't hear about it. And we know that, of course, there is the great tribulation that is coming upon the earth, which is there, there should be no tribulation like it bef uh, that, uh, before it or after it. It's called the great tribulation because it's, it's big. It's going to be the biggest one. We know that's coming. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe not. But here, th that's part of the uncertainty, isn't it? We don't know. I mean, this whole thing could kick off by the end of the year. It could. I'm not saying it is. But we know that it, it just seems like the ball could get rolling very fast. Yeah. Everything's in place. It could all start at any moment. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. But these examples from the past should encourage us about that. To not live anxiously, to not fret ourselves because of, because of evildoers, but to rest patiently in the ward and wait for him because we know that the evildoers shall be cut off. It shall be as the grass that God just cuts down. Now go over to Psalm, uh, yeah, go back to Psalm 37, back, back to Psalm 37. You know, we as God's children should have a brighter outlook on the future. We should not be biting our nails and staying up at night, wandering and, and worrying about what's going to happen in the future. Because one, first of all, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to change what's going to happen in this world. The best thing we could do is just to rest in the Lord and rest in the promise of God's protection that whatever befalls, upon, befalls us, you know, it's by God's hand. Even if it means we do have to suffer. You know, we have that advantage. Look there in Psalms 37 verse 1. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Do you think the workers of iniquity today are worried about what's going to happen in the world today? Do you think all these guys that are uh, you know, out there rioting and burning things down, do you think they're worried about any bad things that might, come to might, might uh, befall? Do you think they're worried about the Antichrist coming to power? No, they want it. They're going to prosper. You know, th you know, they're saying, this is great. One world, let's do this. One world government, that's what they want. You know, we should never be envious at them. Just because they have peace. Just because they seem to think everything's okay, everything's fine. They're not worried about the coming persecution. I mean, they're the ones that are going to be bringing in a lot of them. You know, the wicked, they're not, uh, you know, they're, uh, the evildoers, the, the, the workers of iniquity, they're not fretting. And we should not envy them over that. We should not fret ourselves because of them. Why? Because they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, think about mowing your lawn. Of course, nobody in Tucson knows anything about that, right? <laughs> but where I'm from, they had this stuff called grass. 
Okay, you might have seen it here and there, and it grows, and you got to cut it. You know, there's a little bit of work, but that's what it's going to be like for God when He just one day He's just going to fire that mower up, pull it out of the shed. It's like, well, it's time to mow the lawn, and just and there's going to be no problem at all. He's just going to turn them all into mulch. You know, we should rest in that. Fret not ourselves because of evildoers, because no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much they prosper in the world, we know that ultimately their end is to be destroyed. We have that unique advantage of knowing how this all plays out and that we come out conquerors through Christ. We have the promise of God's protection. Look at verse 7. He said, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's what we need to do today. Instead of worrying about what's going to happen, instead of worrying what lies ahead, the Bible's telling us here to not fret, to not be envious, but to rest in the Lord and to wait patiently for him. You know, sometimes I think about that. You know, what if we do go into the tribulation? You know, as described in, you know, Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation and elsewhere. What if we go through that time? What if we are that generation that experiences that and heads into that great tribulation? And we, you know, sometimes the temptation is to worry and to fret and not maybe want to say, well, I don't want to go through that. And I understand that, you know, humanly speaking, but here's the thing. You know, I don't mean to downplay it, but it's three and a half years. That's it. It's three and a half years, and then it's all over. Then they're done. Then we're with Christ. He pours out His wrath upon this earth. We're in heaven with Him, watching Him just rain vengeance down upon the wicked. And then at the end of that three and a half years, we come back with Christ on white horses and rule and reign for a thousand years. You mean i got to go through three and a half years of some suffering and some difficulty to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand? I'll take it. Give me that. Let's do it. Let's get the ball rolling. I'm not going to sit here and fret and worry about that three and a half year span when I know that I have a thousand years with Christ. I'm going to rest and wait patiently for that thousand years. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rest in Christ. I'm going to rest in the promise that God is going to protect me. <coughs> That's what God's promise does. It gives us the rest. It allows us to wait patiently for Him. You know, and many Christians today, they're just as fearful, they're just as apprehensive as the unsaved. I mean, there's a lot of unsaved people out there. I mean, look what happened when, when the, the whole COVID thing first started happening. Before the whole, what was, what was the first thing that happened? What was the first sign of, of, of COVID might be a real thing? All the boomers ran out and bought all the toilet paper. All the boomers ran out of Costco with just the whole... You know, you go to Costco, you can get a shopping cart or you can get that big cart. It's like a flatbed trailer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're just, I remember someone texted me and said, hey, you better get some toilet paper for the church because the boomers are, are buying it all up. And at the time, I was kind of like, silly boomer. You know, COVID's nothing to worry about. You know, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, what was the worst? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't the worst thing that could happen, but it wasn't fun, was it? But, it, you know, what I'm saying is that, you know, the, we expect that from the world. We expect that from everybody who's just, you know, got worried about their stocks and their bonds and their behinds, right? <laughs> you know, in more ways than one. They're buying up all the toilet paper. They're buying up all the water. We expect that from them. But it's unfortunate when we see Christians today that have that same fear, they have the same apprehension as the unsaved. And why is that? It's because they lack a proper understanding of God's protection. They lack a proper understanding of God's protection. And the purpose of the sermon this morning is to give that correct perspective of God's protection to so the why, so that we can live our, li live our lives not in a state of feeling uncomfortable uh, you know, by the storms that are to come, but rather at peace with the fact that storms are certain. Look, the purpose of the sermon this morning is not so you can just you know, feel untouchable by the storms of life, but rather so that you'll have peace with the fact that no, and the fact that knowing that storms are coming. Storms are coming. You know, let me be your spiritual meteorologist up here this morning. There's a storm coming. There's several of them. Even if it's not in the form of the great, you know, tribulation and things like that. Just life itself is filled with uncertainty. There's going to be storm after storm after storm after storm. And I want to give you the peace this morning and feeling comfortable with knowing that. Not feeling untouchable, but just at peace and knowing that they're coming. You know, that's one of the big, one of the, the, the first things people need to understand is that, one, you can't, control th you can't control things beyond your control, obviously. But also you need to learn to be at peace with things 
that are, that are coming one way or another, rather than just fretting and worrying. If, I should have you go over to Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, we'll look at a very familiar passage, but often it's the most familiar ones that we seem to, we seem to forget the, the meaning behind it or apply to our lives. Matthew chapter 7, I'll begin reading in verse 24. It says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his rock, house upon a rock, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What we need to remember about this passage is that the storm came both to the wise and to the foolish. What was the difference between the house that, that, that stood and the house that fell? Was the fact that one never went through a storm? No, the same storm came to both, but one stood and one, fall, one fell. Why? The wise stood because it was founded upon Jesus' sayings. The wise, those that understand the promise of God's protection, understand that storms come, first of all. That they're not exempt through going through suffering, persecution, trials, tribulations. They're not exempt from the storm. That God comes to both of them. The, the rain falls upon the just and the unjust alike. It's the, un the peace, the, 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 the wise stand through the storm, but not because they avoid the storm or think it's not coming. They understand it's coming, but they understand that God will see them through it. They're founded upon the rock. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't miraculously protect his people at times, because he does do that. We've seen, we see that all throughout Scripture. Go over to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I'll begin reading in verse 22, Matthew 14, 22. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and keep something in Matthew 14. We're going to come back shortly. And to go before them unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he, sent, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But, uh, excuse me, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately J Jesus stretched up forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. So you see, again, God miraculously protects his people. I mean, Peter walks out on the water, and then he, he realizes he's in the midst of a storm, and he starts to sink, and God doesn't just say, Well, you should have had more faith, buddy. See you later. You know, well, so much for Peter. Looks like we need another disciple. Who's next? Right? No, he stretches forth his hand and catches him. And then, you know, mildly rebukes him and they go back to the ship. Now go over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Because there's another miracle in this passage that you don't see in Matthew 14. But it's, in, it's in John 6. So parallel passage says, And when they were now come, when Jesus uh, went down to the, his disciples went down onto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea t uh, toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea, uh, and the sea arose by a reason of a great wind that blew. So that when they had rowed about five and twenty uh, or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is not I, be not afraid. Of course, we understand from Matthew all these other things transpire with Peter, so on and so forth. But look at verse 21. It says, Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Jesus, you know, God, it's not to say that God isn't going to miraculously protect his people. In fact, we know that's exactly what's going to happen in the tribulation. That when things get wor that worse and worse, the Bible says that the beast will make war with the saints. And that except those days should short be shortened, no flesh should be saved. That he's going to make war with the saints and overcome them. But what's God going to do right in, the, right in the middle of that? He's going to miraculously show up just like he showed up in the middle of this lake during the storm and receive them. And they were immediately at the other side. God just takes them right out of harm's way and protects them.
So we understand that the promise of God's protection means this, that yes, sometimes God miraculously intervenes and protects his people. And that's why I believe the best thing you could do to prepare for, for all the uncertain things that might happen in, in our society and, and even in your life is to be right with God. To have faith like Peter, to step out in the midst of the storm and just trust Jesus. If they want God's you know, divine protection, if you want him to miraculously protect you, you need to be right with God. And we'll get into that here in a minute. But the first thing I want to point out this morning about God's promise of protection is this, is that it's not permanent. Permanent. <laughs> permanent. It's not permanent. A lot of people think that God's you know, protection is just, it's always gonna, it's just something I'm always going to have all the time. We read these stories in, in, in Matthew and John, how he miraculously protects people. We read about these things elsewhere in Scripture. And we just think, well, anytime I ever go through anything, God's just going to miraculously protect me somehow. That's not true. We can look at the, and I'll move along quickly for the sake of time, but go look at the example of Job. I mean, it says in Job, you know, in Job, that God let Satan do those things to him. He said, put forth down thine hand and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Who was it that, that lifted his hand of protection off of Job and let Satan attack him? It was God. God let him do that. God let him bring, you know, the ruin of his finances, his house, his children, even let him affect his own body. God lifted his hand of protection and let those things happen. We could look at the example of Christ's suffering. I mean, if there's anybody that God could have just miraculously protected, you know, like he promised, lest, you know, he shall give angels charge over thee, lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against a stone. He, that was the promise that he had, but at some point in Christ's life, when he suffered on the cross, God removed that hand of protection and allowed him to suffer those things. The point where Jesus is even saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? <clears throat> so it should not surprise us that when God allows us to go through suffering, when God decides not to protect us and allow things to come into our life. See, sometimes God's going to lead us into the storm. And you know what? He's not going to come in the midst of the storm. He's going to let us go all the way through it. And it might feel like we're just going to tip right over. The boat might be, and we were just, you know, we're just bailing out as quick as we can just to stay alive. And we're saying, why isn't God protecting me? But think about this. Without the storm, there would have been no miracles. You know, we need storms to come into our life. We need to, and there, you know, there would have been no walking on the scene. There would have been no Peter joining him there. There would have been no calming of the storm. And, you know, there would have been being brought immediately to the other side. We have to go through storms in this life. But notice this, if, if you get, still got something in Matthew 14, go back there. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Who was it that sent them into the storm? It was Jesus. Do you think he was surprised by that? Do you think, whoops, sorry guys, <laughs> I didn't realize there was a storm coming. It said that rose up by the, by, because a great wind blew. And, you know, I believe God sent that wind. God sent them into the, into the ship, said, go on, I'll, go on ahead of me, I'll catch up later. And then God sends the storm. It says in verse 22, and Jesus, and straightway Jesus constrained his di disciples. He's saying, he's like making them go. He said he constrained his disciples to get a ship and go and to go before him. And here's what I want us to understand this morning is that when you decide to live for God, you're being sent into a storm. When you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to be his disciple, you just signed up for a storm. You know, don't be surprised when God sends you into one and says, you know what, it's your turn to get in the ship and go out and miss that storm. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not maybe, shall suffer persecution. If you're going to live for God, you're going to suffer persecution. God's promise of protection is not a permanent thing. Sometimes God lifts it. Sometimes God takes it away. Some God, sent time, God sends the storm you know, when he doesn't come unto us, he lets us go all the way through to the other side. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. Look, when you go through the storm, don't let it move you. Don't let it toss you about to and fro. Understand that you were appointed thereunto. That is the Christian life. Christian life is suffering. It is persecution. It is going through storms. And part of that is just, go, that's just life in general. But at least we have the promise of God's protection that 
that God does not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that we might be able to bear it. He said, and for Verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And you know. You see, the, the folks that never go beyond salvation, I mean, they get saved, and they say, that's good enough for me. My ticket's punched. I'm on my way to heaven. I got my fire escape. I'm not going to go to hell. That's all I need Jesus for. They're never going to know some of the persecution that the Christian knows. You know, the people who just see Peter and the, and the other disciples off, just see you later, have fun on, on, on the, on the, in the boat. We're not following Jesus. We're just going to hang back and let you go uh, uh, follow him. They're never going to go through the storm. They're never going to go through the storm that God sent. But you know what else? You know what else? They're never going to know God's protection either. They're never going to know what it's like to have God see them through the storm and bring them out on the other side. They're going to never know that, that joy of having victory, of being brought through the storm. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look, God's promise of protection should encourage us and should give us hope as we're living in uncertain times. We have to understand this morning is that God's protection is not permanent. permanent. God lifts it sometimes. The Christian life is suffering. The Christian life is tribulation. Look at verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father even of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, comfort who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. When does God comfort us? In our tribulation. What, here, here's the thing. Why do you need comfort if you're not in tribulation? God's not going to come to the Christian, you know, the lazy boy Christian who's just sitting back on Sunday morning doing nothing for God, not living for the Lord, and comfort him. Because he's not suffering for Christ. There's no point in, in comforting somebody like that. But the person who decides to live for the Lord and actually suffers, actually goes through tribulation as they were appointed, that's the person that God's going to come to and comfort them in the tribulation while they're going through it. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Go over to chapter 7. The Bible says in Romans 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Not only should we, you know, be willing to accept tri tribulation, but we should glory in it. We should, we should look forward to it, he's saying here. We glory in tribulations. We're glad. What did Jesus say? He said, uh, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. He said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely in my name. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He said to rejoice, to be exceeding glad when? When they persecute you. When they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. To rejoice. We glory in, tribul in tribulation. Why? Because we have, we have uh, treasures laid up for us in heaven. God rewards his servants. He comforts them. Look, when you go through a storm, when you go through tribulation, you should glory in that because you know that you have God's protection and at least the fact that he's going to come and comfort you and see you through it and give you the strength. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, uh, I think it's verse 4. He said, Great is my boldness of speech toward you and great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And you want to talk about a guy who went through some tribulation. I mean, the Apostle Paul went through some tribulation. I mean, that guy was, I mean, shipwrecked more than once. I mean, he's being stranded on beaches. He's being imprisoned here, imprisoned there, stoned to death here, beaten here. I mean, just pursued from city to city. That guy was persecuted probably more than anybody else we, we know or we know of. But what did he say? He said, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation because he understood that God's protection is not permanent and that God allows us to go through these tribulations so that he can reward his servants and so that he can comfort us. Yeah. You know, when you're in a storm, th that is not the time to question God's protection. That's the time to look for his comfort. That's not the time to cry out and say, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? This isn't fair. That's the time to be joyful. That's the time to be exceeding joyful. And that's the time to learn patience. He said, I'm exceeding joyful all right, we glory in our tribulations. Why? Because it worketh patience. That's the time to understand that sometimes God removes his hand of protection 
and allows us to suffer so that we can be drawn closer to him. Like if we go through some great tribulation or the tribulation or whatever, if, if, they, if they really turn up the heat in this country and we start to suffer for the cause of Christ in this country, I mean, that's the time to draw. We'll be drawn even closer to Christ. At least that's what should happen. That should be the natural reaction is that we just seek God even more on our own. And maybe it'll get to the point where, you know, we can't gather together in church or it's going to be very difficult to do so. I still have this book. I still have the Holy Spirit. I can still get alone with God and pray and read his word and be comforted by the promises of God and not fret myself because of the workers of iniquity, but understand and rest wait, and wait patiently for him, knowing that God's going to cut them all off, that it's going to come to an end, that, there's enough, that this storm isn't, that has an end. That there's, you know, there's blue skies just on the other side of those clouds, that we can go through those things. <coughs> But you know what? The backslidden, they're vulnerable. You know another way God's protection is not permanent is when people backslide. You know, God will take, his per he'll, God will take away his protection sometimes to teach us lessons, to see it through storms, and to, and to teach us patience and so on and so forth. But sometimes God removes his hand of protection when people really need it, and they don't get it. Because why? Because they're, because they're backslidden. That's another reason why God's protection is not always permanent. It's not just to teach us some, you know, spiritual lesson. But it's because we don't deserve it if we're backslidden. <clears throat> Not only does he remove the protection when people get out of sorts with God, but he will even bring them harm. What You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, what about the example of Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> God killed them <laughs> in church. <laughs> right, right there in front of everybody. You know? We know the story. They lied under the Holy Ghost. And God just... Cut them off right there. I mean, if that's not God removing his hand of protection and bringing harm to a backslidden person, I don't know what is. What about the example of Samson? You know, who went out and said, I will, I will, uh, he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go at his other times and shake myself. But he wist not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him, that God had removed his hand of protection and that he was vulnerable. And why was he? Because he was backslidden. So we see that, you know, God's protection is something that should give us peace in uncertain times. But we have to understand that God's protection is not always permanent for one reason or another. And not only that, that God's protection is procured. And by procured, I mean it's something that's obtained. That's what it means to procure something. To obtain it with care or effort. God's protection is not only uh, uh, not permanent, but it's also something that you have to procure it's not just like, I got saved, I automatically have God's protection. We know we're eternally sealed on the day of our redemption, that we're eternally protected from hell through Christ and through faith in Him. But that does not mean that we're just going to live through this life automatically under God's protective hand. That it's something you have to procure. And for sake of time, I'll, I'll move quickly through this point. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. You want peace with your enemies? You want God to protect you? Your ways have to please the Lord. And when our ways don't please the Lord, like Samson, God doesn't protect us and lets his, our enemies have their way with us. <clears throat> the people that God protected the most were the people that served him in the face of per persecution. I mean, just we could think about some examples, and again, I know I'm running short on time here, but think about some of these examples. The people that God protected the most. You say, I want God's protection this morning. I want that peace. I want to have that for myself. Well, think about the people that God protected the most. The most miraculous uh, you know, deliverances that God granted unto other people were those that were, that were serving him in the face of persecution. I mean, think about Daniel in the den of lions. I mean, that would be, that's, that's, a, that's a scary thought to be thrown in, a, 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 you know, not the lion's den, because that doesn't necessarily mean there's any lions in there, but in a den of lions that are hungry. I mean, you know how the story turned out when they actually dropped the bad guys in there. It says they break their bones before they even touch the floor. That's how ravenous these beasts were. And, you know, Daniel, he faced that fear. He went into that. He faced that persecution when? When he was serving God. When he was faithful to the Lord. And when even they made a law that no one should pray, that he went ahead and prayed anyway, that he threw the windows open and just prayed anyway. Right. And he suffered for it. But God protected him, didn't he? 
he sent the angel and closed the mouth of the lion. And he, and, and he wasn't, you know, not a, not a hair of his head was harmed. What about the fiery furnace? You know, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they were delivered, weren't they? they? They understood, they got to experience God's protection. But when did they? When they were in the midst of a furnace. And what was their attitude? If we perish, we perish. You know, throw us in. If God allows us to be burned up, so be it. But they were delivered when? When they were dropped, you know, bound, head and hand, and, hand and foot into the fiery furnace. So we see that God's protection this morning is something that is not always permanent, but rather that it's something that is procured, that it's something that God only grants to people and gives to people that are serving Him. You want God's protection? Then you have to be willing to face persecution. Otherwise, what, a, what need is there for protection if you're not putting yourself in harm's way? Why is there any need to comfort you if you're not in any sort of tribulation? And I want to close with this point here is that God's protection is not only not permanent and not only is God's protection procured, but it is also precious. It's precious. Look, if God's protection is not always something you, you're going to have, if you're, even if you're serving Him, if God's sometimes going to allow Him to, you to go through things and suffer things, that just makes God's protection all the more precious when He gives it. it because it's not guaranteed. It's not always guaranteed. I mean, tell that, you know, tell that to, to, to Christ. Tell that to Job. Tell that to you know, the people in Hebrews 11 who were, who were sawn asunder, that were torn apart, that you know, were naked and destitute, that lived in caves and, and had their dwellings in the rocks, of whom the world was not worthy, the Bible says. Tell them about how God's just always going to protect you. No, He doesn't. Sometimes He allows us to go through these things. But when we do, but it just makes it all the more precious to us. You know, God has promised to be with us and to comfort us in our tribulations, not to keep us from them. Not to keep us from them, but to just be with us as we go through them. So we should never be worried. And if you would, go back to Psalm 37. We should, we'll close there. We should never be worried about suffering or persecution, but rest in the fact that God will see us through. That's the promise of God's protection. Not that God's going to keep us out of harm's way. That God is going to see us through it. The Bible says in Philippians 4, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Look, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, is going to keep your heart, it's going to keep your mind, but it might not keep your flesh. God might have to have you go suffer. You might have to go through, through some actual physical torment some actual physical discomfort in your life. But you can have the peace of God in your heart and your mind, even through physical persecution. But God's peace, this, this peace that passeth all understanding, again, it does not come to those who only want to be protected from harm, who just want to get out of harm's way. The people that are just trying to duck and dodge and avoid any type of persecution for Christ, they're not going to have the peace that passeth all understanding. Who's going to have the peace that passeth all understanding in their hearts and their mind? The people that are willing to face persecution and to go through it. They're the ones that are going to experience it. Look at Psalm 37, verse 37. He said, Mark the perfect man. Not the guy that that's, is sinless, but the guy that has it all. The guy that's the whole package. That's willing to suffer for Christ, to serve Christ, to be faithful to Christ. Mark that guy. And behold the upright people that are going to walk with the Lord no matter what for the end of that man is peace and it's the end of that man that is peace ultimately if we serve God if we're faithful to him if we're perfect if we're upright our end is peace you can mark it down and it's the end of that man it's not every waking moment peace 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 all the time there's going to be storms that come but the peace that comes from understanding God's protection it comes to the perfect. It comes to the upright. It comes to those that are willing to face the storms that God sends rather than avoiding them. Those are the ones that have the promise of God's protection. Let's pray.